Obviously a major malfunction. This has been an NBC News. Tomorrow morning on Today, a complete report on the explosion without warning of the Space Shuttle Challenger. What does it mean for the future of the space program? Tomorrow morning on Today. Clear. So that people understand. Accurate. We'll be right on the money with it. Fair. I just wanted to call and check. When you need news, you need NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening, I'm Doreen Gensler. And I'm Leon Bibb, and this is Channel 3 News Nightside. It was going to be just another routine shuttle flight, but tonight Americans mourn the loss of seven victims of this morning's tragic explosion. It is a story that hits close to home. One of the victims, Akron's Dr. Judy Resnick, will have a live report from her hometown. And tonight a special memorial service for those victims, the congregation at the Fairview Grace United Methodist Church in Fairview Park a church just down the road from NASA's Lewis Research Center. Organ music, a special silent meditation. Many of the worshippers, NASA employees, personally touched by today's tragedy. There was absolutely no warning, no sign of even any problem this morning before the space shuttle Challenger blew up in the sky. It happened just about a minute and 15 seconds after an apparently perfect liftoff. Half a million gallons of liquid rocket fuel turned into a giant fireball. It killed all seven astronauts on board immediately and sent debris raining down for more than 45 minutes. Tonight, we still don't know how it happened or why. Shock. Didn't know what to tell them. Ann Jones is one of 3,500 workers at the NASA Lewis Research Center here in Cleveland, stunned by today's disaster. It's hard to believe. They lowered the flags to half-staff here right away, a memorial to the seven astronauts who lost their lives today. Over the past five years, these workers have watched and worked on two dozen very successful space shuttle flights. They'd become almost routine until today. These people took the news very hard. While some staffers here had to brief a crowd of reporters and NASA employees, some others had a more difficult job, explaining the explosion to a group of school children from Elyria who had come here to watch the liftoff. Nobody knew what to say. There were personal ties, too. NASA Lewis scientist Lynn Bonbaron helped train the teacher astronaut Krista McAuliffe. And NASA Lewis director Andrew Stofan was a friend of Judy Resnick's. On our 6 o'clock news, Stofan talked to me about the frustrating lack of information, even for the experts. But we do not know what caused the explosion. Do you think we'll ever know? Yes, I think we will know. The workers at the Lewis Research Center worked on the design and propulsion systems for the space shuttle. In May, they were preparing to send a Centaur rocket system up for a test on the shuttle, but now it looks like that's going to have to be postponed indefinitely. This tragedy also hits close to home because of the astronauts aboard the Challenger. One of them was Judy Resnick of nearby Akron, Ohio. Dale Solly tells us live from Cape Canaveral this evening that Judy's family is having a tough time coping with the loss of their daughter. It's an eerie quiet that's hanging over the launch site here at the Kennedy Space Center tonight, Leon and Doreen. The families of all seven astronauts, including Dr. and Mrs. Marvin Resnick of Akron, are now in seclusion. They met just a few moments ago now, we understand, with Vice President George Bush and Senator John Glenn, who expressed their extreme sadness at what has happened here today. But as far as NASA officials are concerned, they are doing their best to protect the family's privacy. And with good reason, no trace of Judy Resnick or the other six has been found. The shuttle program was a dream come true for Resnick and a long way from her days at Firestone High School. But being one of America's first women in space was something that fit her and fit her well. With any luck, 10 years from now, we'll have a space station that's just about ready to be occupied and I will still be healthy enough and NASA will still want me and I'll get to get a chance to participate in that. It's true that the teacher, Krista McAuliffe, got the publicity this time around, but the Resnick family can take some comfort tonight in the fact that Judy Resnick paved the road for her. Some comfort, if there's any comfort at all, that can be had at a horrible time like this. I've never seen anything, Leon and Doreen, quite like the quiet, the, the ominous pall that has settled over this entire place, but as shocked as everyone is here, the city of Akron has to be even worse because of astronaut Judy Resnick. Channel 3's Paul Ray joins us now. And Paul, how are the people of Akron reacting to this terrible, terrible tragedy? 
Well, Dale, Judy Resnick meant an awful lot to the city of Akron. After her first flight, she was honored by the city, and she tried to get back here as often as her busy schedule would allow. And perhaps because of those close ties to Akron and many of the people here made uh, today's tragedy more difficult to accept. At first, disbelief, then shock, followed by the insatiable need for more information, especially the word that Judy was safe. But the more they watched, the more it became apparent. The pride of Akron would not be coming home again. At her father's optometrist's office, endless calls with either questions or sympathy. At Judy's high school, shock was still setting in as students gathered to find out the latest. Some could only remember the times when Judy Resnick was full of life and ready to take on anything. Uh, lately, lately I've been there. Uh, kind of bragging that Judy was the only one to ride twice, see, and uh, I'm sorry, man. Uh, I wish I hadn't bragged about that now. To her friends and family, Judy will always be thought of as dedicating her life to the space program, someone who did not fear the unknown. I have full confidence in the shuttle systems. I think I understand them well enough to have that confidence. The shuttle has a good track record of safety, as does the rest of NASA over the past several years, and I am confident uh, that I don't have anything to worry about. Now, not all the important people in Judy Resnick's life were in Florida or Akron today. Her mother was in Cleveland when this disaster struck, and Channel 3's Kim Bratton had a chance to talk with her. Kim? Yeah, Paul, she actually lives in Bedford Heights. At this point, she's not sure if she's going to go to Florida. She's waiting to hear something from NASA. But you can imagine the shock that she's feeling right now. Still, she isn't mad. She isn't blaming anyone for this tragedy. She said on the phone, what's done is done. I also talked with another man in Cleveland tonight who just got back from the launching site in, uh, in Florida. Astronaut Robert McNair was his nephew. Oh, I was right there down there looking at television, and my God, when that thing blew up, I like to faint it. Lucius Ray would have seen the launch in person had it not been postponed. He'd gone down to Florida last week to attend a reception for his nephew. Lucius Ray is 85, and probably one of the biggest joys in his life was seeing his nephew become an astronaut, a national hero. He still has the button he was given when he went to Cape Canaveral to see McNair's first launch. He'll tell you with pride how Robert McNair studied hard and got a doctorate in physics. His nephew was 36 years old and was working as a photographer aboard the shuttle. Robert McNair's lifelong dream was to be an astronaut. You know, where I came from, you know, that wasn't the kind of thing a black kid thought about. But McNair overcame the obstacles and fulfilled his dreams. He also fulfilled one for Lucius Ray, too. Saw something airing out at Mr. Ray's house tonight on that invitation that he got from, uh, from his nephew, astronaut McNair. There was a line in there, something about seeing him in Florida when they got back. It's just a, a very sad situation, Leon and Doreen. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. Sad for the families and for all of us who have watched today. Again, seven astronauts died on board the Space Shuttle Challenger today. 36-year-old Judy Resnick from Akron, 35-year-old Ronald McNair. This was his second space shuttle flight. He grew up in the little town of Lake City, South Carolina. Dick Scobie was the spacecraft commander of this flight. He was 46, had served in Vietnam. He was from Washington State. The pilot, 40-year-old Michael Smith. He was a Navy commander who won the Distinguished Flying Cross in Vietnam. He was born down in Beaufort, North Carolina. Ellison Onizuka was the first Japanese-American astronaut. He was 39, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He was from Hawaii. 41-year-old Greg Jarvis was from Detroit. This was his first trip. He'd been an astronaut only since 1984 and a school teacher. 37-year-old Krista McAuliffe was to be the first teacher in space. She was selected from 11,000 applicants from all across the country. She taught English and American history in Concord, New Hampshire. And for students at the Concord, New Hampshire High School, where teacher astronaut Krista McAuliffe worked, it was to be a day of celebration, watching one of their own leave the bounds of this spinning planet. The students gathered to watch the flight on television. The atmosphere was like a party. They counted down the launch. Challenger was off. <laughs> 
Then came trouble and joy withered to confusion. Then fear crept in as they realized what had happened over Cape Canaveral. They were sent back to their classes in near silence. Reporters were sent away, and inside that school, students and their teachers grieved. When shuttle was launched this morning, among the thousands who saw it from the Cape itself were the parents of teacher astronaut Krista McAuliffe. Edward and Grace Corrigan smiled and cheered with the crowd as the orbiter roared off the pad. Then a hushed chill fell, and they stared in disbelief as shuttle Challenger exploded with their daughter and the six other space adventurers aboard. NASA officials then led the parents away from other spectators. Also watching that horrible explosion today was teacher Gail Klink of Newark, Ohio. She was a finalist for this shuttle flight. She watched from her home. I was just talking to her parents yesterday, about 24 hours ago, at the launch site. I had met Dick Scobie and, and Mike Smith and Judy Resnick in Washington and talked to them, and, and Krista was my friend. In spite of the tragedy today, Gail Klink says the space program just has to go forward from here. And she says she still hopes to fly on the shuttle someday. Another Ohio teacher, Jim Rowley, also applied to go up into space. He went as far as the semifinals. Rowley was watching the launch with his students today, and for a moment, he couldn't understand what was happening. Oh, about 45 seconds after liftoff, a huge fireball. I don't understand. Sky. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Our director confirms that we are looking at... Uh, Checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Can we, can we get the cameras? An awful moment to watch. Jim Rowley couldn't watch it any longer. He left the room, but his students couldn't move. It was a somber President Reagan who spoke to the nation this afternoon, postponing the scheduled State of the Union speech. Mr. Reagan spoke on the shuttle tragedy. He devoted a special part of his speech to the children of America, who may have trouble sorting out today's events and understanding death in the space program. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. A message from the president, especially for the children, as he said. Ohio's U.S. Senator John Glenn, former astronaut, first American to orbit the Earth, said the threat of explosion is always there. And John Glenn said astronauts live with that threat. It is part of the job. It's been 24 years since Glenn orbited the Earth, flying at a time when we did not fully comprehend what space travel was all about. Glenn did not blame anyone for today's shuttle tragedy, but he said this kind of tragedy was bound to happen. It's been an amazing success story up to this very tragic accident today. I think this was, what, the 56th or 57th manned mission, where we're dealing with new complexities and speeds and, and powers that man has never used before. And uh, we had hoped to push this day back forever, but that was not to be, and we all, I guess, intuitively knew that. So said John Glenn, this kind of accident makes us aware of how frail life can be. And nobody knows that better than the people at NASA tonight. Channel 3's Bob Becker takes a look back at some of the successes and failures in NASA history. For the most part, NASA's 28-year history has been one marked with overriding concern for safety and fantastic accomplishments. It all started with Project Mercury, Alan Shepard's suborbital flight in 61. John Glenn orbiting the Earth in 62, and Apollo 11's moon landing in July of 1969. But with these great steps forward, there has been tragedy. The first near disaster was on Glenn's flight. His heat shield came loose on re-entry. If it had come off, Glenn and his capsule would have been burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. NASA's first real tragedy was with Project Apollo. On January 27, 1967, just 19 years ago this week, Astronauts Grissom, White, and Chaffee died in a flash fire as they were conducting pre-flight tests on the launch pad. The manned flight schedule was delayed 18 months. Tragedy hit NASA again in the early 70s when a fuel cell exploded on Apollo 13. The command module lost all power, so the astronauts climbed into the lunar module as they swung around the moon. They re-entered the damaged capsule and safely made it back to Earth. Following Apollo, NASA designed a reusable spacecraft, the Space Shuttle, 
For the most part, it's been successful, except for countless delays on the launch pad for everything from weather to loose heat tiles to broken fuel pumps. But they all pale by comparison to today's in-flight explosion. NASA says that because of the force of the blast, they may never be able to find the reason for today's tragedy. Bob Becker, Channel 3 News, Nightside. Thank you, Bob. Like a lot of America, Dick Fegler spent his afternoon in front of his television set. He says it is not a night for commentary. It is a night for condolence. Leon, uh, I was one of those people who hadn't paid much attention to this space shuttle or the crew on board it. Tonight, it's hard to think of anything else. The president canceled his State of the Union address and gave a eulogy instead. And suddenly it seemed very important to learn things about the people who died, as if we were all somehow in their debt and owed them that. I hadn't known, for instance, that astronaut Judy Resnick of Akron had been a classical pianist, a small fact that pleased me a great deal, but pleased me too late. When the president spoke today, he used two lines from a poem, and I looked it up. It was written by a 19-year-old flyer who died in World War II. Poetry, piano music, and physics. Three expressions of the soul blended today as no machine could blend them because we are better than our machines. Some more of that poem goes like this. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and joined the tumbling march of sun-split clouds. I've done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Up, up in the long, delirious, burning blue, where never lark nor even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind, I've trod the high, unsurpassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. That was the State of the Union message on a night when the State of the Union is grief. Thank you, Dick. Today is the anniversary of another tragic event, the suicide of Cleveland School Superintendent Dr. Frederick Holliday. This is a scene that has become etched in a lot of our minds, the body of Dr. Holliday being wheeled out of Aviation High School one year ago today. Holliday's suicide note wished for better things for the children of the Cleveland school system. And tonight, Channel 3's Paul Orlowski joins us with a troubling report, one that suggests that some things remain the same. During some of what we're going to show you and show the folks aired on our 6 o'clock news tonight, but with the shuttle tragedy, so much in the minds of everyone, we want to make sure that this story doesn't get lost. It is important. Current school superintendent Ronald Boyd surprised me today. He called today the worst of his day of work ever. He is a man tonight with a heavy heart. It's, it's a war. It's a war. Uh, and there's more than one enemy out there. School superintendent Ronald Boyd is the man wearing Fred Holliday's shoes one year later. He, better than anyone, is able to look back on Holliday's suicide and cryptic note and read into it. He knows Holliday's frustration. Reading scores were going up. Parent attitudes were going up. Everything was going up. But yet, he was being attacked. Can you imagine a person uh, putting their life into a job, doing a good job, and, and only get kicked around for it? There are no pretty pictures to help tell this story. Boyd's words do it. If he sounds frustrated, it's because he is. He's had four months of the same stresses Dr. Holliday felt. I feel that pressure, the pressure to, you've got to do this today, you know. You've got to clean it up next week, no problems with the system, and it's not going to happen. Uh, I've uh, reviewed some of the articles that have come out uh, in the paper uh, over the last four days. I mean, you know, about four straight articles that basically are not true. And uh, I feel very, very frustrated in it. And if uh, these are the kinds of things that happen to Dr. Holliday, I can understand uh, how he must have felt when he evidently took his life. Even today, as I prepare to go to a doctor this afternoon to see about my own health because of the strain and stress and the hours that I work, uh, I feel pretty let down. Frederick Holliday wanted things to change for the children of the Cleveland school system. Since his death, studies show kids' reading scores have gone up. Now, certainly problems remain, but many credit the improvements, particularly in reading, to Fred Holliday. Where there seems little change 
is in the job of superintendent. One holiday ran from in death, and that after only four months on the job, Ronald Boyd compares to a boxer fighting a war. Those are his words. Thank you, Paul. Okay. It was a rough morning out there for some Cleveland school buses and for their passengers, too. Dr. Boyd decided to keep the schools open today in the cold and snow. Well, that left these kids from Grace Mount School sitting on a broken-down bus for more than half an hour. Mechanics tell us it was frozen brake lines, but the kids gave up the wait after about 35 minutes and hiked home in the two-degree weather out there this morning. Ooh. Well, as we talk about the weather, we ought to talk to Shane Hollett to find out if what we can look for tomorrow when it comes to rush hour driving. That's right, and we go straight to the weather tonight. We've dropped all the commercials in this newscast to give us extra time to cover the news tonight. Shane? We have some warmer temperatures coming up, uh, Doreen. It's going to get warmer, but it's not going to get warm outside. And because moisture is increasing and the temperature is starting to rise, we have some snow coming on the or snow on the horizon right now. Outside right now, the temperature is stabilized. It's actually gone up one degree. It's eight degrees outside. Minus eight is the chill factor, so it's changed quite a bit from. Earth